putting in a potato packing facility in the old high school here. Some of this stuff still has to go up. That's all the music room stuff. And at present, we don't have a music teacher, so it just got shoved in here. You know, you know the day-to-day -day battles with the dust and dirt in that facility and the molds from um, using evaporative coolers that were of old stature that didn't work properly and having tuna fish smell throughout the cafeteria and the whole office space because that water would sit too long and it would just become moldy and rancid and you had to deal with that on a daily basis and you know the amount of uh, dirt that we had throughout that building was incredible so those the, the, when the wind blew you could see the wind blow through your building the old Sangre de Cristo High School yes uh, I did go to school here uh, Back, graduated in the 80s, and uh, my kids uh, went to school here. Two out of three of them graduated here, and my youngest will be graduating in the new school. You know, the, 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 the old facilities were, were utilized for their time, and I think they served their purpose well. In the new technologies, in the new age that we're in today, we have better ways of doing things. We have better atmospheres for kids, and I think that that's what they had then. It was 50 years old, and you know, and it was put up as a metal building, which metal buildings are not the best school facilities there are, but it's what they could get at that point in time, because at that time there weren't best monies, there weren't uh, capital construction monies. It was each district fending for themselves and how they could save their money and get that done. So, you know, they built the best facility they could possibly build for their children, did the very best they could. But now with some help from the state, we were able to put our children into a much better atmosphere in a more, more correct learning environment. I, you know, there's so many things I do like about this school. Um, coming today, coming to work every day into a beautiful facility and knowing that the kids are safe, knowing that, you know, we're not hurting them with, with asbestos, knowing we're not putting molds and stuff into them and having allergic reactions, those types of things. Just that healthy climate, the safe, secure climate, and it brightens their day. There's a lot of these kids come from homes that this is just unbelievable to them. It's new, it's big, it's clean, it's gorgeous. And that makes a lot of difference in their attitude. The BEST program had its genesis in the Giardino lawsuit settlement. Giardino started in 1997. It was a class action suit that I was one of the lead attorneys on. It settled. It was just on the issue focused exclusively on capital construction. Settled in May of 2000 and settled for $190 million that was to be doled out over a period of 10 years. And so the money that was in the general fund um, already allocated for Giardino was the money that was then the general fund contribution for the BEST legislation. And the way BEST then kind of Giardino morphed into BEST was I took the Speaker of the House at the time, Andrew Romanoff, on some tours of schools because my strong sense was that people, even if they toured them during campaigns or driving through communities, hadn't really focused on the really desperate and dilapidated conditions of the schools, and that proved to be true. And I think when Speaker Romanoff came down to the valley and saw just how horrible the conditions were down here, he was moved to try to do something, and so he worked with Treasurer Kerry Kennedy and Mary Wickersham in, in Kerry's office to put together the best legislation. And it has worked, I would say, you know, reasonably well over the few years that it's been handing out money. Um, there's a component of a district match and then there's a state match for the larger renovations. Well, my per this is my personal opinion, so this is not as yeah. a best board member, but I believe that the state has an obligation to kids. And so what we see now is some problems where districts with really low property wealth and very low incomes are struggling to pass bonds. And I don't know why it is that then those children are destined to continue to have to go to school and facilities where they're basically going in dangerous conditions, they're going in conditions that um, are not healthy, conditions that are certainly not conducive to providing the education that they need. And so I think that um, that's why I say reasonably well, because when a community, and I'm thinking of Leadville, um, isn't able to pass a bond, and I'm fairly partial to Leadville because I started in Leadville and Jardino, that's where the Jardino family lived back in 1996, and I drive up there and I look at the schools, and it's been all these years and not a whole lot has changed. I just think that the state can't step away from its responsibility to, to those children. So 
with that caveat, I would say it's done well with that understanding. And, and we saw that same thing play out in Mapleton, and they were eventually able to pass a bond. But um, we have these kind of imaginary lines that are school district lines. And why is it if a kid lives within one set of imaginary lines, does he not get the same school and he, as other students? And you really see it in Leadville, because if you drive over the imaginary line over Fremont Pass into Summit County, and you see that beautiful high school, and you drive over the other imaginary line over Tennessee Pass into Eagle County and see that amazing high school, it really brings it home. The best grant process is lengthy. It involves a lot of steps. I can't remember how many tens or hundreds of pages the application is, but um, you know that's one of many grants that superintendents have to apply for. And so, I mean, you have to put it in context when you say how difficult is it to apply for a best grant because you're also having to apply for reading grants and you know all in operational grants and all those kinds of things on top of running your school oftentimes being the principal and the superintendent being the chief discipline officer you know doing everything that a rural superintendent has to do so I think it's important to recognize the overall challenges of a day-to-day -day rural superintendent's life as far as schools that have applied and not received them, I'm aware of several. One is Kim, Colorado, which was one of the centerpieces of a video that we did for the Lobato trial. Um, the school there is, is really in need of an overhaul. Not just the school, but the athletic facilities and just the whole um, school environment down there needs, needs some new attention, especially from the state. And the community there is um, very property poor, very supportive of their school, very supportive of their teachers and students, but, um, you know, they were turned down for a best grant. Uh, um, you know, we, we have no fire sprinklers. Uh, we have, there's, there's no uh, monitoring of, of fire alarms or anything like that that you might expect in a, in a, in a newer facility. We have a, an alarm right at the front door here at the high school and it, it works off of a, a switch in the office about eye level uh, that pretty much anybody can uh, flip. In fact, every once in a while we'll have a student ask, well, what's this switch? And they'll, they'll turn it on and kind of get a scare really quick and flip it back off. But uh, um, it's, it's antiquated. Somebody has to know that there's a fire and go and flip the switch and then everyone leaves. We actually have a very successful basketball program. Our, our girls have won the state championship and so we have a lot of people in our, our gym. Unfortunately, our bleachers are not up to code. The stairs are not uh, adequate. We've got a, an aging community here and they have great difficulty getting up and down the, the stairs. compliance issues. Uh, our building's log, it's rotting, we have logs that are hollow. Uh, the infrastructure itself, the hallways are too narrow to be in compliance. We have a lot of things, so we're looking at a pretty major overhaul. Size is a major issue. Uh, the classrooms really aren't uh, designed for the capacity for the, the kids coming in. Um, other issues that we have, um, of course, you mentioned the structure. This this building we're in now is not in the greatest of shape, as has been stated. Um, little things, and I guess they're not little, but uh, historically for us, when we have track as an example, you may have noticed that we have no track. There is no field. So when we have track, if you come in during track, our kids are running on the street. Literally, they're running on the highway. They're doing their practice out here, dodging cars not the safest situation to be in. So it would be ideal to have, obviously, a place that they can pursue those activities safely. In a perfect world, we wouldn't have pursued this for two years. We would have delayed pursuing the, uh, 
the best program for two years from now. And the reason being is that the mine will be in production, at least the, the uh, forecast is in two years. So we'll know what kind of influx we get for the students from the mine. We're already seeing some influx from just the, the core drillers and some of the preliminary work that's being done. If I was to compare a classroom that we have now, and I'm sure you'll have it on video at some point, looking at a classroom, and then walk into one of the new classrooms and say, oh, Center High School. When I walked through and I went down for the ribbon cutting, um, you walk into the halls. They're big, spacious, bright, colorful. It, it, it's gorgeous. You just, uh, it, it's, it's, I don't want to use the word happy, but that's what comes to mind. It's just a place that, that, uh, it's inspirational, I think, when you walk into it. If you walk down our halls and going back to when it was built, I mean, that was the style. You have the wainscot, the dark, dark wood, the old walls. It, it's dark, and I would have to say almost dismal in that appearance. And it's it's uh, it, it's wood, and that's what the the play. Yeah, well, here's an example. You know, this is very typical of what we have here. When you walk into center, it's very bright. It's cheerful. But the rooms are spacious. Our rooms are very tiny. Their rooms are spacious. You got the high ceilings, the way the light comes in. Uh, obviously very, very well designed. We're pretty convinced that this building was probably built on bar napkins back in the 40s. Uh, one guy kind of headed it up and then he'd have volunteers and miners come down and work on it. and Did a great job. It's uh, served its purpose, but you can tell it wasn't as uh, professionally planned as say the architects that architects that did center. So. If you go to a district like Center where they've had a old school with you know that was not particularly encouraging to walk down the halls and um, then you go to a new school and you see the kids playing on the playgrounds and you see them shooting hoops when they didn't have an opportunity to do that and you see the teachers um, in these classrooms with you know windows and daylight and heating and and the environment is overall just improved and the talking to the teachers and the administrators and some of the kids the the change is, is magical for them and it sends all sorts of messages to those kids that they count that we care about them that um, that their education is important and so I think it leads to them maybe even taking their education a little more seriously because I always struggled with for example, when kids would be in sports and you would travel, and so you would travel and you would go and you would see facilities that were way better than the ones that you were in. And I'm sure kids would think, why is it that way? Why am I not as important as the kids in those school? Or the converse, where kids would come to their school and they'd be embarrassed about the quality of their locker rooms and the facilities. And you hear stories of kids not wanting to go into these locker rooms because they are pretty run down and, and dreary. And and then just on the education side, you know, to I saw the, the like the computer room now in the center, and it's all centralized, and the science labs actually have science equipment. Go figure, right? And you know, wiring and plumbing for gas and electricity, and so you can actually do science experiments in a science lab, and you can take care of a spill if it happens. I remember in Centennial before they got a new school in the science lab, they had a mop. In the science room, they had no drain, <laughs> no way if anything happened to get rid of chemicals or anything that would happen in the room. And you kind of would look at it and go, oh, okay, that's the safety features of the mop in the corner. Um, and you see the rooms wired for technology. And I mean, it just, it, it just opens up doors for opportunities for those kids to be able to learn and to achieve in ways that you never could have done in an old facility.